Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Matthew Scott. I'm president of the Carnegie Institution for Science, so I'm here to welcome you to another in our series of talks. I have my official messenger pin, which I am honored to receive and to wear. We're celebrating an incredibly successful event here tonight, and I'll tell you a few things by way of introduction. Astronomy is the oldest of sciences. The sun, moon, and planets of the solar system were undoubtedly the first astronomical objects observed and measured. The earliest known lunar calendar, a series of pits found recently in Scotland that are shaped like the moon's phases and calibrated with the solstice, is believed to be nearly 10,000 years old. Here at Peace Street's Root Auditorium, our ceiling echoes those early Scots. Made you look. <laughs> <laughs> our understanding of the solar system has changed immeasurably over time, and it keeps changing. The different character and dynamism of planets continues to amaze, including the features of our own, like this, if we could run this movie, which I saw in Nicaragua a couple of weeks ago. The, one of the privileges of being associated with Carnegie is we have all sorts of adventurers, and they go to places like this. This is the Messiah volcano in Nicaragua, and it's been quite active lately and gives a glimpse of the dynamism of planets and the potential for really dramatic events to happen uh, in the vicinity of quite a large number of people, in fact. This place was absolutely amazing to see and listen to and watch, especially for a biologist like <coughs> me because none of my chromosomes and genes behave in quite such dramatic fashion. And I was guided and entertained there and educated there by Diana Roman and Lair Wagner, who were my experts who were teaching me about this geology. Now, just 10 years ago, the number of planets in our solar system was officially reduced from nine to eight, a demotion due to the fresh revelation from 1992 and onward that, in fact, there are thousands of Pluto-sized chunks out there in the realm no known as the Kuiper Belt some about the size of the District of Columbia, but with fewer political conflicts. <laughs> These discoveries are what demoted Pluto from planet status to dwarf planet in 2006. Astronomers have also discovered objects beyond the Kuiper Belt. One of the most recent is a body discovered late last year by Carnegie astronomer Scott Shepard, who's here with us tonight, and his colleagues working at the Gemini Observatory. The body called V774101 set a new distance record for a solar system object. Then two years ago, our Scott Shepard published evidence in the journal Nature for a new ninth planet far out beyond Neptune. The clustering of distant solar system dwarf planets suggested that something larger but unknown is affecting their positions. That unknown body might be 200 times farther from the sun than Earth, a place where it's important to wear down parkas. <laughs> Scott Shepard explained the evidence in this way, in a somewhat self-serving use of the word, the great disturber, the inferred planet, can shepherd objects into <laughs> similar types, I'm not making this up, into similar types of orbits that constantly keep the smaller objects away from the bigger object. Just a few months ago, astronomers from Caltech provided further evidence in, in favor of Scott's idea, announcing computational evidence for the ninth planet. Because telescopes can peer way beyond the boundaries of our solar system, it might seem surprising that new solar system objects, particularly one as large as a planet, remain undiscovered. But it is not particularly surprising to astronomers. And if we could have the next slide, you'll see that in fact the newspapers are well aware of the implications there on this. They first of all have published illustrations of the planet this is called an artist's conception. <laughs> it should be called an artist's invention. And in the next slide, you can see they know exactly what's about to happen. If we could go to the next slide. You see, we're in <laughs> This is from April 6th. So this is very current information from an important scientific journal. And you are in 
Well, I think you'll make it home, but after that, there's no saying. So even if the ninth planet exists, it does not emit light and moves over enormous distances, so the hunt for it is challenging. Now telescopes are beginning to search the vast region of space where this elusive planet may be hiding. But it's not just the discoveries of new objects in our outer solar system that keep the science of planetary astronomy thriving. Recent observations of celestial bodies we have seen for hundreds of years are yielding new and often surprising information. No one suspected that the moons orbiting the giant planets would have volcanic activity or deep oceans, nor had anyone predicted that Neptune would have rings. There is also still much to learn about the inner solar system. Mercury, the subject of tonight's lecture, is an excellent example. For many years, this smallest of planets was considered among the least interesting of any objects in the solar system. It was thought to be an old, burnt-out cinder, so similar to Earth's moon that it wasn't worth thinking much about. After Mariner 10 flew by the planet in 1974 and 75, no other spacecraft was sent near Mercury for more than 30 years. Then came Messenger. This spacecraft entered Mercury's orbit in 2011 and remained there, sending back thousands of high-resolution photos until it crashed and burned far past its expected life in April of last year. It's now in planetary heaven somewhere. <laughs> Its suite of seven instruments mapped the entire planet using both visible and infrared light, measured the topology of its surface, studied variability in its atmosphere, and documented changes in its magnetic field. The resu results showed that Mercury is far from boring. It is a world wholly unlike any other in the solar system. Overseeing the mission to Mercury from launch to crash and burn has been our guest tonight, Messenger's principal investigator, Dr. Sean Solomon. Since 2012, Dr. Solomon has been the director of the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University, where he is also the William B. Ransford Professor of Earth and Planetary Science. Before moving to Columbia, he was for nearly 20 years the director of Carnegie's Department of Terrestrial Magnetism here in Washington, D.C. He came to Carnegie in 1992 after serving for two decades as a professor of geophysics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he joined the faculty after receiving his bachelor's from Caltech and his PhD from MIT. Dr. Solomon is an international leader in the fields of seismology, geophysics, and planetary geology. He has undertaken oceanographic expeditions studying how new crust is generated on Earth, which is part of the reason I thought it appropriate to show that lava lake. He has made major contributions to understanding plate tectonics, and he has participated in or led many spacecraft missions, including the Magellan mission to Venus, the Mars Global Surveyor mission, the Grail mission to the moon, and most recently, the Messenger mission to Mercury, which is great alliteration, much better than those other expeditions. <laughs> so while at DTM, our department, he, in addition to leading a diverse group of Earth scientists and astronomers, he served as principal investigator for Carnegie's role in NASA's Astrobiology Institute. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has received many prestigious awards. Among them are the Geological Society of America's G.K. Gilbert Award, the American Geophysical Union's Harry H. Hess Medal, the Arthur L. Day Prize and Lectureship from the National Academy of Sciences, and in 2014, the National Medal of Science, which is our nation's highest scientific honor. So I'm very honored to have this chance to introduce him and bring him to you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, Sean Solomon. Thank you, Matt, for that terrific introduction. I feel we have a new urgency for understanding our neighboring planets. Uh, given that Scott Shepard's Planet Nine is going to destroy Earth before the end of the month, so <laughs> pay particular attention. Uh, Mercury's uh, not not great real estate, but uh, see what you can find. It was my 
pleasure uh, to lead the messenger mission. We began 20 years ago when uh, I was at the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism at the Carnegie Institution. I'll, I'll show you the, the way that Carnegie weaves back and forth through this mission over its lifetime. Uh, we didn't think it was a burnt out cinder. We thought it was an interesting target of study. Here are some of the reasons why Mercury is very unusual, even though it's a member of the inner solar system and a sibling of Earth, Venus, and Mars. Uh, we partnered, the science team, with the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory, who designed and built and managed the spacecraft after launch. I should add that the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory was itself begun uh, during World War II by scientists from the Carnegie Institution. That's another story for another time, but there are very strong links between the two institutions. Um, as Matt already alluded, uh, Mercury is the understudied sibling uh, in the inner planet family. Uh, and here is uh, one person's, namely my, list of spacecraft <laughs> that have been delivered and worked uh, by any spacefaring agency uh, to the inner planets besides Earth, Mars, Venus, and Mercury. And even after Messenger, you can see that uh, Mercury is comparatively understudied and worthy of future investment by NASA. Uh, I say that because there's so many NASA folks in the audience. <laughs> the uh, mission uh, that visited Mercury before Messenger, Matt also mentioned this, uh, was in the 1970s, the last of the Mariner series. Mariner 10 had taught us everything we knew about Mercury. Uh, except for some important findings from Earth-based astronomy for nearly 30, for more than 30 years, uh, and, and flew by the planet Mercury three times. It was the first spacecraft to have multiple planetary flybys after flying by Venus. Uh, so it, it whetted the appetite for uh, further exploration of Mercury, but that exploration didn't take place until the Messenger mission. And there are a variety of reasons for that. Uh, one of them is uh, Mercury's in a tough neighborhood. Um, it is very close to the sun, which is a very hot star and a uh, very massive object. So uh, getting into orbit around Mercury is a challenge for any spacecraft going into the inner solar system and surviving at Mercury's orbital distance, uh, which can be as, as, as much as uh, at a distance at which the sun is as much as 11 times brighter than it is at Earth's distance uh, when Mercury is closest to the sun. Um, Messenger solved the problem of getting into orbit in a way that cannot be depicted in a single uh, static image except in something pretty complicated like this. What you're looking at is a map looking down on the ecliptic Earth's orbit from the North Celestial Pole of all of Mercury uh, Messenger's orbits around the Sun between the time it launched in 2004 uh, and when uh, it arrived for orbit insertion six and a half years later after 15 revolutions around the Sun and, and what was key uh, was a discovery made about 10 years after the Mariner 10 mission uh, that flying by other planets, here Earth once in this timeline on the bottom, Venus twice and Mercury three times with, sorry, didn't want that, with major propulsive events um, in between uh, to target <laughs> the spacecraft for those flybys, took enough energy out of the orbit so that the orbit, as you can see, shrank from the big blue orbits down to the smaller red orbits and became closer and closer to the orbit of Mercury. So that in 2011, on March 18th, uh, on the fourth encounter of the spacecraft with Mercury, the encounter velocity was sufficiently low that the propulsion system on a spacecraft that could be launched from Earth under the NASA Discovery Program uh, could do orbit insertion. So uh, it was, uh, the, the victory of some mission designers going back to the mid-1980s that enabled this mission and the first uh, orbiter mission around Mercury. Uh, it was absolutely critical that the flybys be done very precisely. Those flybys were very important for us. They gave us new science about Mercury. They allowed us to uh, test all of our 
science payload instruments and to operate them simultaneously. But the flybys had to be threaded uh, like the veritable needle uh, in order that the spacecraft be sent on the proper trajectory for the next maneuver and the next flyby. Uh, and so uh, precision navigation was absolutely central to the success of this mission and uh, the science team owes a great uh, deal of debt to, uh, to some uh, very good navigation team at APL that uh, it flew this spacecraft really through all of those six needles, uh, those six planetary flybys. Uh, and uh, the space, spacecraft navigation team got better uh, as they went along, uh, and they invented uh, with our spacecraft, which hadn't been designed for it, solar sailing. Now, solar sailing is when you use the very sl slight radiation pressure of sunlight uh, on the spacecraft itself to slowly but continuously m move the trajectory of the spacecraft. Uh, and as a result of learning how to solar sail this spacecraft, uh, the navigation team was able to uh, make the small corrections that are, are inevitable after each of the major flybys and save on the propellant that would be needed later in the mission, and I'll, I'll come to that in just a couple of minutes. But the, the active use of solar sailing in deep space was a first uh, for, for NASA uh, and uh, really, was enabling for our mission to accomplish some of the science that uh, we were able to do late in the mission. Uh, to address the hazardous thermal environment uh, uh, that uh, Mercury encounters every day, uh, we had to design a spacecraft that uh, could deal with the twin hazards of the sun and Mercury's hot day side surface. Uh, the the uh, spacecraft addressed the solar heating uh, with this sunshade, which you see here being assembled at APL, a ceramic cloth sunshade that was so good an insulator that even when Messenger was at Mercury's closest distance to the sun, as long as that sunshade was between the sun and the spacecraft, kept all of the electronics on the spacecraft, except for the solar rays, uh, at room temperature uh, and allowed us to use pretty conventional uh, albeit radiation-hardened uh, electronics. When we did go into orbit in 2011, uh, we went into the orbit shown in red, uh, and that orbit, too, was chosen in part for thermal management. Uh, it was a highly eccentric or elliptical orbit. It was initially a 12-hour orbit. Um, and the closest approach was at a very high latitude because the planet on the day side is hottest at the equator and coldest at the poles. Uh, so every time you come close to the planet, you have to absorb the heat from the day side. Uh, and uh, you use, messenger used, the high part of the orbit to radiate that heat back out into space. And so the eccentric orbit allowed that close approach, uh, which would have been uh, prohibitively uh, damaging in terms of, of heating the spacecraft had we had, say, a circular orbit at anywhere near uh, the altitude of closest approach. Uh, the, the thermal engineers were uh, sufficiently confident that we could change the orbit a year in from a 12-hour orbit that you see in red to an 8-hour orbit that you see in green uh, without uh, creating any great hazard to the spacecraft, and we did that to have more time close to the planet and to have three close passes every day instead of two. Toward the end of the mission, this was the pattern of closest approach. Uh, toward the end of the mission, the effect of the gravitational pull of the sun was to drive the altitude at closest approach of messenger closer and closer to the surface. So as long as we had propellant, we could raise the closest approach altitude in an orbit correction maneuver, as, as this one has done here. So the, the solar gravitational pull is driving closest approach uh, downward. Remember, we're, we're getting about uh, three orbits per day. Uh, we use propellant to raise it, but it's still uh, very rapidly changing as a result of the uh, three-body problem, including the sun. Uh, and by the time we got to uh, this orbit here, 
we ran out of propellant. And so uh, the engineers did something really miraculous. Uh, they used a gaseous helium, which had been uh, part of the propulsion system and used to move the propellant around from the tanks to the propulsion chamber. They used the gaseous helium not to move propellant, which had all been exhausted, but to exhaust from the spacecraft. And it served as a propellant. It imparted thrust to the spacecraft. And it allowed us to make additional maneuvers that uh, extended the lifetime of the uh, mission another several weeks. But even uh, with that clever, miraculous move, uh, the gaseous helium eventually was exhausted as well. And so uh, the inevitable uh, push of the sun uh, onto, uh, of the orbit, uh, onto the parameters of the orbit resulted in this last uh, very tiny uh, correction that gave us an impact on uh, 30th of April, as we had planned uh, when we were in full uh, view before the spacecraft went behind the planet of uh, Earth's uh, DSN. Uh, what was important uh, about these last orbits was that we got incredibly close to the surface of Mercury. And for several kinds of measurements, which I will mention, uh, that gave us an unprecedented opportunity to answer questions which we had not been able to do uh, in the conventional orbit originally planned, uh, where all the altitudes were all above uh, 200 or even 100 kilometers. Now, I should mention that the science team has been meeting in this room. It's a terrific room to have a meeting uh, all day today, and we'll be meeting again tomorrow. And we've been talking about all the scientific results from the mission. Uh, and in about half an hour, what I have left, I can't possibly talk about all these topics. I show this image to show you that we've uh, created mosaics of the entire surface of the planet. That you're looking at a view of Mercury that is not true color but it is one in which uh, the reds and the blues are enhanced in a way that image processing can produce to show how subtle uh, variations in color and reflectance can uh, be distinguished with the help of image processing, and because you're gonna see some images that use these colors later on. Uh, Mariner 10, which had visited Mercury before it, saw less than half the surface of the planet. And, and as you saw here, uh, we've seen the entire planet now, except uh, a few areas at the poles, which I'll be talking about. Um, and that gave us an opportunity to name a lot of new features on Mercury. And I just wanted to mention that, that uh, one of them is the Carnegie Rupus. Um, that has nothing to do with directly with either Andrew or the Carnegie Institution, because uh, these cliffs or scarps, which are the surface expression of great faults at depth, uh, are named by convention of the International Astronomical Union after famous ships of discovery. Uh, but the Carnegie Institution operated such a ship of discovery in the 1920s. It was called the Carnegie. It made seven circumnavigations of the world measuring the magnetic field in parts of the ocean where no such measurements have ever been made. And so indirectly, <laughs> this rupes is named after this institution and a man named Andrew, but only indirectly, and the astronomers went along. All right, I said I'm gonna have to restrict the topics that I talk about and some of my many messenger science team colleagues who are sprinkled through the audience and to whom I'm going to turn if I get any difficult questions when I'm done. <laughs> uh, some of them are going to be disappointed because I'm not talking about their favorite work or their favorite instrument. But I thought in the time left, I could talk about three topics of su at sufficient depth so you get a feel for how we made the cri critical measurements uh, and how those measurements changed our understanding of a, one of our closest planetary neighbors. So I, I wanna talk about the composition of Mercury's surface. I wanna talk about Mercury's magnetic field. Uh, and I wanna talk about what are called the polar deposits, which as you might expect are at Mercury's North and South Pole. What we've known uh, since really the 1950s is that mercury has an extraordinarily high density for its size. The 
ratio of mass to volume uh, is higher than any other planet except the Earth. And if you correct for the effects of pressure on density, Mercury is made out of the densest stuff of any of the planets. And the only common element of sufficient density that we think is, uh, makes up a large fraction of, of any of the inner planets, including Earth, is iron. And so it has long been expected that Mercury is mostly iron and that most of that iron resides in the central metallic core. And uh, a question that has been with us for many years, but certainly was, was uh, accelerated by the Mariner 10 mission, was how do you make a planet that ends up mostly iron, in which there's this giant iron core and then a very thin rocky shell around it. And there have been a lot of ideas in the literature, uh, particularly after Mariner 10, uh, and they involved generally very energetic processes involving plan uh, forming a planet very close to the sun, forming a planet and then blasting most of it away by a giant impact, uh, forming a planet and then vaporizing most of it by an active early sun. And all of those ideas involve some extended phase of high temperatures. And so one of the predictions of all of those ideas was that Mercury would be depleted in elements that are called volatile, in elements that are easy, easily uh, uh, changed to a vapor phase by high temperatures and thereby removed. Uh, there were also other differences uh, in the different hypotheses. And so one of the things we set out to do with the messenger was to make measurements of the surface composition so as to be able to distinguish among the ideas then in vogue for how Mercury was assembled. And we had two principal uh, geochemical instruments. Uh, one made use of X-rays because the sun is a source of X-rays. Mercury doesn't have much of an atmosphere as Earth does to block those X-rays. So they impact the surface. Uh, they interact with surface atoms. Uh, many of those atoms absorb the X-ray energy and fluoresce at a characteristic uh, X-ray wavelength. And so we radiate those wavelengths back in space but measuring the X-ray spectrum uh, can serve as a kind of elemental analysis. And the other instrument we took measured gamma rays, which are generated in two ways. One is uh, as a result of the interaction of very energetic charged particles known as cosmic rays with the surface. Uh, they impact a nucleus, generate a, a cloud of neutrons. Remember that for later. Uh, and those neutrons interact with other atoms uh, in their vicinity and generate gamma rays as a result, again, at diagnostic energies. And then there are naturally radioactive elements that in the course of decay of individual atoms give off uh, gamma rays of still different, but st still diagnostic energies. So here is an early result uh, augmented with additional data that was led by uh, Larry Nittler a Carnegie scientist, um, from the X-ray spectrometer, uh, making measurements of the major element composition of big areas on the surface of Mercury. Uh, the, the Mercury results are shown in red, and they're compared with rocks on this plot from the moon uh, and average compositions for the Earth for uh, both usual and unusual rock types. A lot of people thought that since the Mercury is heavily cratered and has a surface that looks in some zeroth order way like the moon that the that Mercury's crustal composition would be close to that of the moon and it's not at all close. Uh, the most abundant uh, rock type on the earth is the, are the basalts, the volcanic rocks of the ocean floor uh, and Mercury doesn't look like those rocks. Uh, the Earth's continental crust is made up of rocks that are different from the ocean floor, and they're more variable, but the average is shown by this star over here. And uh, one can make similar plots for Venus and for Mars, and Mercury is different from all of those. That it, it ha has uh, more magnesium, less aluminum, less calcium compared with the Moon or Earth, uh, and compared with Mars and Venus. So it's not like any of the other planets in the major elements. The X-ray spectrometer uh, here in a paper led by a former Carnegie fellow, Shoshana Weider, uh, obtained enough data on magnesium and aluminum relative to silicon that they could map the uh, 
composition of the surface just using fluorescent x-rays. And uh, you see some of the conclusions up on the right that uh, older terrain, uh, which tends to be in, in light blue, and most of this is higher in magnesium silicon than the younger volcanic smooth plains of mercury, which here show up as dark blue. Uh, and there's this really unusual area dubbed the high magnesium terrain that we still don't understand and we're talking about at the science team meeting that is extraordinarily high in a magnesium, low in aluminum. Uh, it seems to be a part of the crust that is morphologically uh, undistinguished. Uh, it's in very old terrain. And one idea that uh, Weider has led is that this is an old impact basin that excavated very deep rocks from the interior and we're still testing that idea. But it, it's uh, one of the most unusual areas on Mercury. One of the clear results from both geochemical instruments is that iron is very low in abundance on the surface of mercury. Uh, here you see numbers like one or two weight percent, uh, and you see that there's some variation as, as plotted by the XRS data and an average for the Northern Hemisphere from the gamma ray spectrometer data. It's hard to measure, there's not much of it there. Um, and this means that mercury is, a, is in terms of bulk composition, we, and remember it's mostly iron on the basis of its density, uh, has most of that iron as metal, and almost none of that iron is oxidized and part of the rocky crust. And this is very different from the Earth and the Moon and Mars, uh, all of which have a lot of iron in the Earth's rocky shell and in the crustal rocks that you and I walk on every day. Um, and it means that uh, mercury was assembled from material that was more chemically reduced than uh, the material that, from which Earth or Mars or Venus was assembled, or even from which uh, the Moon was assembled. And that chemical reduction means that, uh, that uh, a metal like iron is almost entirely in the metal phase and not at all oxidized. Another early surprise from the X-ray uh, spectrometer on mer uh, mercury was the abundance of sulfur. Here you see sulfur plotted against calcium, again ratio to silicon. Uh, uh, this is from a, another paper by Shoshana Weider uh, in which Larry Nittler was involved. Um, and the, the biggest surprise was, was that the average value of this sulfur is much, much higher than uh, on Earth or Mars, or certainly than the Moon. Um, and something like 10 times higher than on the Earth. And we normally think of sulfur as one of these volatile elements, one of these elements that is removed by the application of high temperatures. So, and so if mercury formed by a process that had to do with being bathed in a hot nebular gas or uh, being subjected to an early sun or being uh, the victim of a giant impact that stripped off most of the rocky shell, and left behind a uh, heated uh, interior. Uh, the expectation was that sulfur, uh, as a moderately volatile element, would have been depleted relative to the Earth, not more abundant. Uh, in part, this is uh, related to the uh, chemically reduced nature of the precursor, precursory materials of mercury, but in part, it, it was a violation of the prediction of all of the models before Messenger for how uh, Mercury was assembled. And those violations continued. Uh, here's a paper that Patrick Plowski of APL led on the element potassium. <coughs> potassium and thorium are radioactive elements, so it's easy to measure their abundances by using gamma ray spectrometry. Uh, the moon is well known to be a, a body that has had a lot of its volatile elements, it's easily removed by heating elements, uh, depleted. And you see that uh, the ratio of potassium, a moderately volatile element to thorium, an element that's not at all volatile, but has some chemi chemical similarities to potassium, is much lower on the moon than it is on Earth, you see in green, or on Mars, you see in gray. Uh, and Mars and, and Earth uh, lie on this line, which is a little depleted with respect to some meteorites, but uh, is a standard planetary value. And so it was another surprise that the numbers for Mercury fell on the same line for Mars and Earth. It, it's not depleted in potassium relative to thorium compared with sister planets. 
an even bigger surprise, chlorine, from some work of Larry Evans and colleagues last year. Uh, this is, uh, these are plots of chlorine versus potassium. Chlorine's more volatile than potassium. Uh, and you see the mercury uh, values are up here, similar to what is regarded as a volatile rich planet Mars and some volatile rich meteorites, substantially more chlorine relative to potassium than Earth, which is down here by an order of magnitude. So mercury is not depleted in volatiles. Uh, and there was one more surprise. Oh, sorry, this is not that surprise, but it is still a surprise. Um, this is uh, a plot that uh, Poplowski did one year later on uh, uh, contouring the abundance of uh, potassium in the Northern Hemisphere. And what you see is that the highest values are around the highest latitudes. Uh, and uh, there are two ideas for why this might be so, and we can't distinguish between them. One is that uh, there are chemical differences uh, that are seen in other elements in this general area. And if potassium is correlated with those chemical differences, that could simply be intrinsic to the rock type of the surface and be high at these higher latitudes. But another intriguing idea is that potassium is possibly mobilized by high temperatures, the diurnal variation in temperatures at low latitudes. And so over time, potassium may migrate to the colder areas of the poles as a result of successive heating events every mercury day. And some support for that is provided by the fact that other volatile elements that I won't show here, like sodium uh, and chlorine, um, are also uh, higher at the poles than they are at low latitudes. Uh, but what it really is needed is a measurement of these quantities uh, in the southern hemisphere, and that will come uh, with the next mission to Mercury, but not with MESSENGER because of its eccentric orbit. And I want to tell one last interesting story that was published just this year, also led by Patrick Poplowski. Uh, and this has to do with what makes Mercury dark. Uh, you see on the left uh, three images uh, of areas that are type areas for uh, what's known as low reflectance material that shows up as blue in these enhanced color images. Low reflectance material is some of the darkest material on Mercury. It is almost always associated with material that has been excavated from depth by a large impact and then thrown out over the surface as the impact crater formed. Um, as I said, it's some of the darkest material on Mercury. Here is the reflectance of Mercury's surface as a function of wavelength across the visible to the near infrared. Here is some of the brightest stuff on Mercury, high reflectance red planes. Here are these three areas of low reflectance material. Here's kind of an average for the Northern Hemisphere. And below this are just ratios to the, uh, to the red curve up here. Um, there are a lot of ideas that possible explanation for what makes this low reflectance material low in reflectance uh, that have been kicked around for a number of years, including oxides of iron and titanium, including uh, distributed uh, small particles of iron. Um, there's not enough iron and titanium to, uh, to achieve the darkening uh, uh, that is seen, however, on the basis of the X-ray results. And that led uh, uh, Poplowski to lead an effort to make a new kind of geochemical measurements of these low reflectance materials using the very late orbits in the mission when the spacecraft passed very low over the surface and the low reflectance material filled or nearly filled the field of view of key instruments. And the key instrument to really answer the question of what that lower, what is making the low reflectance material dark was a, another spectrometer called a neutron spectrometer uh, that looks at the cloud of neutrons that are around the planet as a result of interactions with those cosmic rays. Uh, but at the low energy end of the neutron spectrum, uh, the flux of neutrons can be enhanced or uh, reduced depending on what elements are around on the surface. Uh, and uh, what you see are three out of hundreds of individual passes over these low reflectance ma materials, three type areas. Uh, and you're, you see a comparison between the neutron count, uh, uh, a residual relative to a model, uh, of uh, the surrounding terrain and the low reflectance material. 
it's clear here, it's a little less clear here, a little less clear here, but uh, when you look at the hundreds of passes, uh, the statistics bear it up that the thermal neutrons are enhanced over the low reflectance material uh, on a consistent basis. And the only element that is common, consistent with this enhancement in thermal neutrons and the behavior of the near infrared reflectance and other geochemical measurements is carbon. And so that has led to the proposal that the darkest materials on Mercury are dark because they have a higher abundance of carbon than the average terrain, and that carbon is in the form of graphite. Now, there was an earlier idea published last year by Kathleen van der Kouten and uh, Francis McCubbin, Francis McCubbin also a former Carnegie Fellow, uh, that suggested uh, there was a mechanism for concentrating carbon near the surface of Mercury. Uh, we think that the inner planets and the moon all began at, with a hot stage known as a magma ocean where the energy of accretion had been converted to so much heat that there was a magma, deep magma layer that completely surrounded the outer part of the planet. And the, this idea on the moon goes back uh, nearly 50 years. Um, and uh, is an explanation for the lunar crust because in a lunar magma ocean, as the magma ocean cools and different minerals crystallize at different temperatures, uh, a very common mineral Michael, help. I'll use this one. Um, floats in that magma ocean, creates a crust and uh, that's the highland crust we see today. Uh, it floats because the magma is denser than the crystals. It's denser because on the moon, that magma has enough iron and titanium to be dense. On Mercury, there's not enough iron and titanium and none of the common crystallizing minerals float in that magma ocean. So there wouldn't be a crust unless the magma ocean has carbon and van der Kouten and McCubbin showed that if there is enough carbon, that graphite, when it crystallizes, will float and could form an early crust on Mercury. Uh, and then uh, that crust would have been almost immediately covered by volcanic materials mixed by impact, uh, remelted uh, by intrusive uh, magmas, uh, but that carbon would have been enriched at upper levels by this magma ocean crystallization sequence. And so, we're left with the intriguing hypothesis, which is uh, supported by the combination of all of the uh, geochemical data we've acquired that, uh, that Mercury uh, started out with a substantial budget of carbon. Some of that carbon ended up in the rocky fraction. Uh, it was concentrated toward the surface by a magma ocean, and we still see it today as darkening the surface. So here's a list of some of the surprises that we got out of the composition. The volatile elements are much more abundant than we expected or than were predicted by any of the models prior to our mission for how Mercury was assembled. We can reject them all, which is a very unusual scientific outcome. Uh, moreover, uh, we learned that Mercury, uh, with its metal-rich composition and iron-poor, rocky fraction has to be derived from much more chemically reduced precursory materials than any of the other a large planets, and so it says that there was some reservoir in the disk of gas and dust from which all the planets formed that was different for uh, that which became Mercury. And finally, uh, we see this high abundance of carbon that fits all of the data in a way that no other explanation does uh, and supports this idea of van der Kouten and, and McCubbin that uh, there was a magma ocean on Mercury and it produced a carbon flotation crust. Okay, let me turn to Mercury's magnetic field. I should say uh, several things by way of introduction. First of all, we knew that Mercury had a magnetic field from Mariner 10. Mariner 10 carried a magnetometer and flew close enough to the planet, two out of its three flybys, to measure that internal field. We didn't know much about its geometry. We didn't know what it was caused by. We do know that the Earth's magnetic field arises from the convective motions in Earth's fluid, metallic, iron-rich core by a process known as a dynamo. It converts uh, 
rotational energy and convective energy uh, into magnetic energy and powers the magnetic field that produces our magnetosphere that shields us from the solar wind and a lot of cosmic rays for that matter. Uh, and so Mercury uh, was seen to have a magnetic field by Mariner 10 much smaller than that of the Earth uh, by, by two orders of magnitude and magnetic field strength at the surface. And we didn't know enough about the geometry of the field to know whether it was made by an Earth-like process or not. Here you see an important rendition. Uh, Thomas Zerbuchen and his colleagues at the University of Michigan put together an illustration of the major elements of the environment of Mercury that are dominated by the interaction between the magnetic field coming out from the sun as part of the solar wind, the interplanetary field, and Mercury's intrinsic magnetic field. And as at the Earth, there are important boundaries uh, like uh, this bow shock, sorry, that bow shock there, and that magnetopause. And, and this area here, this within the magnetopause, the so-called magnetosphere is the place dominated by the magnetic field of the planet instead of the interplanetary field. And it affects uh, charged particles. It affects uh, a lot of very dynamic phenomena having to do with the interaction uh, between solar phenomena and planetary phenomena. But I, I want to concentrate on the magnetic field. Uh, and I want to show you this diagram, which is a little complicated, but was the first clear uh, derivation of an important aspect of the geometry of the internal field uh, from orbital observations, uh, led by Brian Anderson of APO. Uh, it was a determination of the magnetic equator, the point uh, on each orbit at which the magnetic field, the internal magnetic field of Mercury was aligned with the spin axis because it produced this surprising result, which you see over here on the right. This is a plot of the offset of the magnetic equator from the geographic equator for a whole bunch of orbits that marched around the planet in different longitude. And what you see that is they're all offset in the same direction. They're all offset by about 500 kilometers, and there's not much variation with longitude. So that means that Mercury's magnetic field looks like that of the Earth's field, except the Earth's field is centered the center of our planet, Mercury's field is offset. It's offset by 500 kilometers, which is a lot for Mercury. It's about 20% of the radius of the planet. There was no prediction of any model that this would be the case. The fact that there's no variation to speak of with longitude means that the, the dipole, the bar magnet, if you will, at, at, at the center of the magnetic field uh, is aligned with the spin axis to within very high accuracy. Uh, there were some technical possibilities that uh, other models could fit these data. Uh, Anderson led an analysis of more distant crossings of the magnetic equator far behind the planet. And even though they're more scattered, they supported the view that this offset was real and was a, a simple offset of the dipole. And so the magnetic field of Mercury is very asymmetric around the equator. Uh, to a degree uh, 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 not shared uh, by uh, any of the other planets, um, and yet it is symmetric about the spin axis. Uh, in particular, the field at the North Pole is much larger than that of the South by more than a factor of three. It affects the geometry of the magnetic field. It affects the interaction of charged particles with the surface. Uh, it affects the way that the uh, Mercury's atmosphere is generated by the interaction of charged particles with the surface uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that really wasn't appreciated before we were able to go to Mercury and see this offset. We don't fully understand it. We think that the magnetic field of Mercury arises by the same convective motions in its fluid outer core as does Earth's field, uh, but we don't, I can't say fully, uh, grasp why it is that the field is offset so systematically uh, in one hemispherical direction over the other. An important result came toward the end of the mission uh, when our spacecraft got closer and closer to the planet. We had been looking for evidence of crustal magnetization. When volcanic rocks are laid down on Earth, in the presence of Earth's magnetic field, they acquire a magnetization. You can measure them. You can measure them in the field. You can take the rock back to the laboratory. You can measure it in the lab. 
And if you're looking at an old rock, it's telling you about the field at an older time. If you're looking at a recent rock, it's telling you about the recent field. Um, but these kinds of measurements are used on Earth all the time to work out the history of Earth's magnetic field. So the question was, are there magnetized parts of the crust of Mercury? We also know that there are magnetized parts of the crust of the Moon. We think the Moon once had a magnetic field. It doesn't anymore, a global one. There are large magnetic anomalies and portions of the crust of Mars. We don't know that much about the history of the Martian magnetic field, except there's no global magnetic field on Mars uh, today. Uh, but Mercury has a global magnetic field today, so we were on the, on the lookout for a magnetized crust. Catherine Johnson, another uh, former Carnegie fellow, uh, led this analysis. And it was, it was fairly complicated. But the key was it required us to get very close to the surface. And if you got close to the surface, and if you took out the known parts of the internal field, and if you took out the parts of the field generated by currents in the magnetosphere, and you looked at what was left on some orbits, you could see systematic variations. And after a while, she noticed that some of these uh, sequences of ups and downs repeated on successive orbits. And that convinced her that she was seeing something real and that it was coming from Mercury's crust. And when she started laying those down over maps of the surface, this, these are data all taken at uh, altitudes less than 50 kilometers, uh, and you're seeing uh, uh, excursions around uh, an average near zero after, because this is a residual after lots of other contributions to the field have been removed. Uh, you could see systematic geographic patterns, some of them uh, tied to uh, areas of smooth plains, uh, which we think are volcanic, uh, as in this region. Moreover, in a few of these regions, uh, Catherine showed this to, uh, figure to our team just a few hours ago. Um, in a few of these regions, the same area was overflown at different altitudes. And here you see the amplitude of the signal at 35 kilometers altitude, we're getting very close to the surface, and a couple passes at higher altitudes. I remember we went through that sequence of orbital maneuvers that kept changing the distance of closest approach. And uh, as you go higher above the surface, the contribution of whatever it is producing, these anomalies gets lower and lower. So that by the time you get above 100 kilometers, uh, there's nothing to be seen above the noise. You have to get below 100 kilometers to see it. And it increases with strength as you go closer to the planet, as it would if the source of the magnetism is very shallow, uh, 10, 20, 30 kilometers below the surface, no more. Uh, and it has the right behavior for that kind of crustal source. So the implication is that Mercury's crust, including this area, by, by the way, that has Carnegie Rupus, named after our ship, uh, contains minerals capable of permanent magnetization, meaning a magnetization that will last for billions of years. Uh, and the strength of the anomalies vary. There's some correlation with the volcanic smooth plains. Those plains have been dated. I can't tell that story. But on the basis of the density of impact craters are thought to be nearly four billion years old. So Mercury's magnetic field was present very early in its history. We don't know what the geometry was back then, but we know it was around early in the history of the planet. And I want to close th with this third topic on polar deposits. Uh, polar deposits are a name that uh, Earth-based astronomers came up with in 1991. So what's that, 25 years ago, um, when they discovered using a radar on the Earth, that the polar regions of Mercury are radar bright, that they reflect more of the radar than the rest of the planet, and they do other things to the radar signal. That's very unusual. Uh, and as the radar images got better and better, as th this image shows from uh, Mercury's North Pole, um, it was seen that the bright areas coincide with the floors of impact craters. And it was known that Mercury's spin axis is almost perpendicular to its orbital plane. And so an impact crater at a very high latitude near a north or south pole would be in shadow, if not all the time, then most of the time. And as you got closer to the poles, uh, the, the likelihood of, of being in permanent shadow was enhanced. And so the idea was put forward 25 years ago. 
uh, because of the radar characteristics, because of the uh, spin state of Mercury, uh, and because uh, of this association of these radar deposits, radar viewed deposits with uh, impact craters, that we were seeing water ice. That was the idea 25 years ago. They had nothing but these kinds of radar images, that this is water ice in areas in permanent shadow on the floors of impact craters on the planet closest to the sun, on the planet that ha at the equator has a range of temperature on, uh, from day to night of 600 degrees centigrade or 1100 degrees Fahrenheit, ice at the poles. So we wanted to test that idea and we took a bunch of instruments to do that. One of them was simply a camera system. This is some work of Nancy Chabot uh, and colleagues from 2012. She looked over the course of a solar day of the south polar region of Mercury and simply asked what fraction of time is every area in sunlight. And you see that fraction at the bottom, and uh, all the areas in black, uh, that fraction is zero. Uh, Mercury's spin state is extraordinarily stable because of a resonance between its spin and its uh, rotation, re revolution around the sun. Um, and uh, so ma making a measurement for one solar day is like making a measurement for a billion years. If, if there's no sunlight that shines in this crater at the South Pole over a course of several months at Mercury, uh, it never shines. Uh, there's a variation with longitude that has to do with Mercury spin orbit resonance as well. So that was a key uh, uh, test that led to this comparison uh, that Chabot did uh, that led uh, where the radar images are compared to the locations of craters that host regions of permanent shadow, and it's a perfect correlation. All radar bright features near Mercury's south pole uh, are in shadowed areas, so that's a nice test. Remember the neutron spectrometer. Uh, the neutron spectrometer is the tool of choice for looking for hydrogen, because among all elements on the surface of a planet, the one that is best at absorbing neutrons over a variety of energy ranges is hydrogen. Uh, David Lawrence of APL led a study of the uh, neutron absorption as a function of latitude in the northern hemisphere of Mercury. Uh, and he uh, did this comparison uh, with two different energy ranges for neutrons. Uh, intermediate energy known as uh, epithermal and, and a higher energy that I'll show next. Uh, what you're looking at are three curves, uh, two models and data. The two models are in black and blue, the data are in red. The black that is flat is if the polar deposits have no hydrogen, no hydrogen relative to typical terrain on Mercury. And the blue is if all of the polar deposits are full of water ice and they have a hydrogen abundance equivalent uh, to water ice, 100% water ice equivalent, WEH. Well, and you see the data in red. And uh, for e these epithermal neutrons, the data are a wonderful fit to having all the polar deposits consist of water ice. And they're a very bad fit to having the polar deposits consist of something else that uh, is not distinguished in hydrogen. The higher energy neutrons, known as fast neutrons, there aren't as many of them. The data error bars are much larger. Here you see a comparison again between two models. The black is no hydrogen and the polar deposits. The blue is 100% water equivalent hydrogen and punchline gone. The red data at the highest latitude split the difference. So they don't follow the blue curve, but they don't follow the black. These are higher energy. They're easier absorbed by a thin surficial layer of something that's much lower in hydrogen. So the way to fit both data sets is this one here, uh, a burial of water ice by a lower hydrogen containing material tens of centimeters thick. Um, but water ice being present, just not at the surface in most of these deposits. Messenger carried a laser altimeter uh, using a near infrared laser wavelength and that uh, in a paper uh, led by Greg Newman from NASA Goddard, uh, also at this meeting today, um, he measured the reflectance at the laser wavelength of the polar deposits and, and the areas around them. 
And uh, this is a pretty complicated map. This is using only observations looking straight down or at nadir. And so because of the orbit, there's an area blocked out until we started looking at off nadir observations. Uh, and the average reflectance is, matches the average for Mercury of something like this. Uh, and the areas that have polar deposits show up as dark with half the reflectance, okay? Uh, and in these areas, uh, thermal models that are derived from the measured topography predict that the temperatures at the surface are too warm for water ice to be stable at the surface, but they predict that water ice would be stable if buried by a layer tens of centimeters thick. And what the laser showed us is those areas are dark at the laser wavelength. Now I want to show you some images, again led by Nancy Chabot, um, taken with our camera system looking into the shadows. And I'll start with that uh, crater at the top, 112 kilometer diameter Prokofiev, one of the, it's actually the largest crater nearest the North Pole, uh, and a uh, fuller crater farther from the pole and smaller. Um, this shows a mosaic uh, of the Prokofiev crater showing all the portions of the crater that see sunlight. Uh, so it had to be done as a mosaic. And this is a baseline for comparison with other data sets. Here's Earth-based radar. So the yellow area is radar bright uh, from Earth-based images showing you uh, the areas that have these deposits that show up in radar. And they coincide with the shadowed areas in Prokofiev. These are contours of the laser reflectance, now looking off nadir from some data that Greg Newman collected, uh, showing th these very high reflectance values in the areas uh, of permanent shadow where you see the polar deposits. Uh, so these are bright, much brighter by a factor of two or three than the average for Mercury. Now, under these conditions, if you really stretch the imaging, you can begin to see details of this dark crater floor because it's not 100% dark. There's a bit of light that comes in reflected off the walls and off the peak, and that's what Chabot did. Uh, she produced this image uh, by stretching uh, the crater floor, and uh, she draws attention in particular to the area of this image that coincides with the radar bright deposit seen from Arecibo, Oh, sorry, this is the background. There's the radar bright data. So going back and forth, you ought to be able to see that the area that coincides with the radar bright deposits is brighter than its surroundings, even on this dark crater floor. So much like the infrared uh, wavelength measurements of the laser, uh, this is now visible, uh, broad band visible wavelength of the floor of the crater in reflected multiply reflected light, showing that it's brighter than the surroundings. This is an area so sufficiently close to the pole where water ice is predicted to be stable at the surface of the crater floor. So the hypothesis is this bright material is water ice. And it's only because we're close enough to the pole uh, that water ice is stable at the surface that we see it directly in the images and in the laser measurements. Fuller Crater is farther from the pole. Uh, Chabot did the same kind of imaging. Here you see what the floor looks like, nearly permanent shadow, uh, but with the image stretched. And uh, uh, I don't even have to use the laser pointer because she added these arrows to draw your attention to this very dark deposit. Note its sharp edges. Uh, there are thermal, thermal models I don't have here, but this boundary coincides pretty closely with a, uh, the edge of a region that is sufficiently cold uh, to trap uh, some material uh, in a solid form that becomes volatilized at higher temperatures. It's too hot to, for this to be water ice, and water ice, of course, would be bright. This is dark, uh, and it's uniformly dark, and it has these sharp edges, and it's dark uh, in the visible wavelengths, and it's like the image you saw a few slides before, it's dark to the laser at near infrared wavelengths. So what is that stuff? Uh, we have only a conjecture, but the conjecture is illustrated by this cartoon. Uh, and, and the cartoon imagines that the water ice on the surface of Mercury was most likely delivered from somewhere else. Uh, 
Mercury is not thought of as a water-rich planet, despite the fact that it's uh, more abundant in many volatile species than we expected going there. But we know that many comets and volatile-rich asteroids pass inside Mercury's orbit. You've seen pictures, perhaps, of comets even grazing the sun. Uh, so they easily pass by Mercury, and all it takes is for one large one recently, uh, or several smaller ones, but also recently, to impact the surface of Mercury. The constituents of the comet volatilize on impact, uh, and some of the atoms and molecules find their way to craters near the North and South Pole. This is the North Pole, and North is to the left. Uh, and uh, this is sh the region of shadow, uh, imparted by the topography, because the sun is shining from the near equator. So in this region, the ices accumulate, they're lost, uh, where the sun shines, uh, they, they tend to be concentrated where uh, the shadow is permanent, and there's some dark material also brought by the comet that, by hypothesis, uh, is not only dark, but is stable to higher temperatures than the ice, than the water ice. And if so, it will tend to concentrate at the top of this deposit where the ice is vaporizing away as what the sedimentologists called a lag deposit, uh, and uh, eventually it will form a dark layer uh, on top of the ice. And by hypothesis, it is this dark layer that we see directly in the imaging. It is this insulating area that allows this ice to be stable in places where the surface temperature is too hot for water ice to be stable at the surface. And it is this dark layer that shows up uh, as the required uh, layer several tens of centimeters thick to explain the different neutron measurements. So what is this material? It's, by this hypothesis, delivered by comets or volatile-rich asteroids. It's spectrally very dark, much darker than Mercury, which itself is the darkest of the inner planets. Uh, and it's a volatile that is removed at above some temperatures that are higher than the stability temperature for water ice. And so a hypothesis led by one of our team members, David Page at UCLA, not at this meeting, is that this is carbonaceous material delivered uh, by the same comets that bring the water ice to Mercury that uh, is common in the outer solar system, that is seen spectrally in comets, that is common in uh, volatile-rich meteorites. Uh, it doesn't say anything about the molecular form. It might be quite complicated, but it's extremely dark uh, and uh, is thought, uh, in fact, to coat, to coat a number of uh, dark and reddish uh, outer solar system objects. So if this hypothesis holds, and this really remains to be tested by future spacecraft, uh, then uh, not only have we confirmed the 25-year-old hypothesis that the polar deposits on Mercury consist of water ice, but we've discovered that uh, a lot of their stability is enabled by a covering insulating layer that is uh, much darker than the rest of the planet uh, and itself is a volatile and is likely to have arrived by the same mechanism uh, and in fact is likely to be organic material uh, coming from the same most likely outer solar system sources as the water ice. So I will close with this summary. Uh, and again, uh, repeat that uh, we've been spending days talking about many other scientific returns from this wonderful mission. Uh, but uh, I've been able to talk at length only about three. Uh, the first is that the formation of mercury, to our surprise, yielded not only a high ratio of metal to rock, but substantial retention of volatiles the opposite of what was predicted for all the formation models for Mercury before we went there. And this is therefore changing our view of how all the inner planets must have been assembled. Uh, Mercury's magnetic field generated like on Earth by a magnetic dynamo today yields a field with a geometry we did not expect and was not predicted by any dynamo model, axisymmetric, strongly asymmetric about the equator. We also not now know that that field was active not only today, but four billion years ago. 
And uh, that's proving to be a challenge. How to account for a field that was active four billion years ago and today in terms of the models as we, as we know them today for the evolution of the core and the factors that contribute to uh, the field geometry from dynamos in such cores. So it's gonna challenge our understanding even of Earth-like dynamos. And finally, Mercury's polar craters. Uh, we verify this 25-year-old uh, idea that the radar right deposits are indeed near surface water ice as postulated by the radar astronomers, but they include a dark uh, additional component, a superficial layer that thermally insulates them and is itself a volatile, probably carbonaceous. And if so, what does that mean? That means that the planet closest to the sun, the planet with the highest variation in temperature over the course of each day is a witness plate to the delivery of water and organic compounds from the outer solar system to the inner solar system. That delivery must have happened not only on Mercury, but on Mars, on Venus, and on Earth, uh, over the whole history of the solar system. Uh, and we spend a lot of time wondering how the Earth got its water, how the Earth got its organic material. There may be a planetary neighbor where at least the recent histories of that process is fully preserved. We just have to go back. Anyway, thank you for your attention. <laughs>
get close to Mercury with all the orbital tricks that Messenger used, but you, you need a propulsion system to land. There's no atmosphere. You can't use uh, uh, parachutes to help you like you can on Mars. Um, and then when you land, uh, over most of the planet, you've got to deal with the fact that uh, the day lasts for three months and nighttime lasts for three months and the temperature excursions between day and night are, are very large, uh, 600 degrees centigrade at the equator. If you went to the poles and you went into one of the permanently shadowed craters, you could indeed sample the polar deposits. You could look to see what the material, the dark material at the surface of most of those deposits is made out of. You might be able to uh, dig or core down 20 or 30 centimeters to get to the water ice. The challenge would be that you couldn't rely on solar power. So you'd need to bring a power system. Um, you would not have the uh, diurnal variations in temperature to deal with. You just have cold temperatures, but uh, no colder than space, in fact, warmer. So uh, that would be an interesting place to land, and there would be some interesting things to do. So next we'll find out when we're leaving. <laughs> <laughs> and after the November election, some of us <laughs> may want to. <laughs> So what I wanted to know <laughs> is uh, based on your uh, observations of the ancient field, whether you could actually determine if the ancient field was stronger than the current field or weaker. In other words, what ha what's happened to the field in its strength over time? Uh, the answer is no, I don't think you can. Uh, we have Katherine Johnson herself in this audience and she can, uh, uh, say I'm saying something wrong or, or stand up and answer the question better than I can. But um, there are uh, too many trade-offs in trying to determine the strength of the ambient field at the time those anomalies were acquired. At this point, we don't know the magnetizing mineral. We don't know the depth extent of magnetization. Um, we don't know the contemporaneity contemporaneity of uh, anomalies in different parts of the planet. Um, so it would be challenging to reconstruct the geometry which you would need to go after the magnetic field strength. It's a tough enough problem on the Earth or the Moon uh, where you have better, you, you can have samples you can take to the laboratory and you can dissect them and uh, you know exactly what the magnetic carriers are, but you don't have that at Mercury. Now, yes? Yes, K Catherine Johnson is indeed in the audience. Stand up and, and, and add something or come to the mic, better yet. Fair enough. Um, if one of the things that would really jumpstart Mercury science, we talked about this at our meeting, is if somebody funded by NASA or NSF or something <laughs> were to find a meteorite for Mercury. And that, it were, it, and that it was a convincing meteorite for Mercury. And, and some of our team members are talking about writing a paper on what it would look like in order to be convincing that it's a, a meteorite for Mercury. There are none in our collection that have been confidently identified. But there ought to be, the dynamicists say, uh, the flux of meteorites from Mercury to the Earth is sufficiently high. There ought to be a few in our collection, given that we have close to 100,000. I don't know what the number is lately between the Japanese and the Americans. We've got lots of meteorites. Um, and if we had one, then we could start to address those questions, just like we do with a uh, sample from the moon or Mars in our laboratories. Okay, let's um, thank not only Sean, but the messenger uh, mission people who are here with us tonight. Thanks to all of you, and thanks for a wonderful talk. <laughs> My pleasure, thank you, Matt.